Welcome to Art and Objects' current important paintings and contemporary art catalogue. Uh, this is catalogue 81 for Art and Objects since we started the business in 2007 and this is one of our loveliest and most varied catalogues in this category for quite a long time. All of the works are currently on view at Art and Object, 3 Abbey Street of course, and online. The catalogue is online, www.artandobject.co.nz and the auction is this coming Thursday, 7th of August at 6.30pm. Ben and I are going to talk you through some of the really interesting works uh, in this current catalogue. In this catalogue we've got a lovely but small component of contemporary photographs and uh, this is one of my favourite images. The train spotters among you will notice that we've had several of these works by Michael Patakofi over the years. They are of course from his series The Consolation of Philosophy from 2001. In that series I think there's 12 images, each done an edition of 8 and uh, they all, or each of the works, take their titles from sites in which the Maori Battalion fought. So we have uh, Mazines, Calais, uh, Turk Lane, Passchendaele, and this one here is called Amiens. And uh, it's a beautiful image. Um, I think it's one of the most successful in the series. I think the work gains a lot of its power, a lot of its heft, its strength, both conceptually and aesthetically, by being a photograph taken by a sculptor. There's something wonderful about the way it sort of punches out off the surface and if you've ever had the pleasure of living with one of these, the way they sort of occupy a domestic given space in a way that most two-dimensional images simply don't. Conceptually there's wonderful layers of meaning to this work. Paracofi, of course before he was an artist, was a, a floral arranger. So there's something nice and autobiographical about these series. As I said before, the works take their titles, their inspirations from the sites in which the Maori Battalion fought. So there's a, an element of remembrance, of homage, of respect to them. And also lastly, flowers before European times, before the colonisation of Aotearoa, were a symbol in Maori society of masculinity. Of course, when Europeans came, they became feminised, and now they're really seen as a sign of femininity, of course. Parakofi is sort of reclaiming that image in a way. And I think these sorts of images, they're so popular because they're just the type of image you just never tire of living with. One of the most fascinating developments in contemporary photography in the last few years or in the last 10 years or so A has been the shift from, from analogue to digital and the resulting change in the aesthetic of photography. But I think one of the main shifts that's taken place is that shift from the taking of a photograph to the making of a photograph. And we've got two wonderful examples here by Jay Hoon Lee and by Peter Madden in very different ways. Jae Hoon Lee puts the emphasis on the making of the photograph into the digital technology of Photoshop where he seamlessly collages and cuts and pastes and stitches together this wonderful image of Piha Surf in a way that it becomes so abstracted you almost don't know what you're looking at. Peter Madden is an artist who makes his images in a completely different way. There's nothing uh, contemporary or digital about them. Rather, he takes the pages of old National Geographic magazines and makes his image in an analogue fashion, meticulously cutting and pasting the image together to create wonderful new worlds, dioramas of, of days past, of images past, that have a wonderful contemporary relevance. We're very pleased to, to be able to offer a, a fabulous selection of Rick Killeen cutouts from 1985 to 1993. This is Time to Change the Greek Hero number 2 from 1985 and as installed here it presents quite differently from the image that you'll find uh, in the catalogue or online and that's part of uh, the secret and the joy of Rick Colleen's cutout works in that you as the installer uh, becomes an active participant in how the work presents. Now the subject matter of Colleen's cutouts vary, they are merged in the late 1970s in the classic insect series. As the cutouts developed through to this period in the 1980s, they became more playful and more illustrational, more painterly, even sculptural, because in this particular work we see a number of the individual cutouts, there's 27 of this work, actually in two parts attached. So there's a wonderful complexity, a sense of play, and quite a mysterious but pointed challenge to the hierarchies of the traditional painting on canvas. And here we have a, a much more intimate, smaller scale uh, cutout, quite delicate, entitled How Do We Learn from 1992. This work really, I think, plays on the idea of the fragment in that many of the images on the individual cutouts are not centered, but look like they have been collaged or excised from some other larger whole. Uh, and this work here can be assembled almost like a mosaic. 
but there's a wonderful delicacy and intimacy here in the way that Colleen has managed the variations uh, that the cutout form provides. In the mid-1960s, while working at Auckland Art Gallery, Colin McCann famously came across William Hodge's famous painting of Dusky Sound. Immediately, he became fascinated with the work and produced a small series of works. This is where we have to be a little bit careful because McCann once infamously said, when the waterfalls started flowing, they started flowing in the hundreds and hundreds. Well, we know that that's probably not quite true. Through the McCann database shows us that there is around 40 or 50 waterfalls, not the hundreds and hundreds McCann refers to. So there wasn't that many, but nonetheless, they did start flowing quickly and they flowed over a, a, a one to two year period, sort of 1964 to 1965. Primarily small, produced on hardboard, all of which feature this wonderful sort of swinging arc, the swathe of light through the darkness. And this example we have in the sale, I think, is among the finest little waterfalls I've ever offered. Across the top of the sky, you have this uh, classic McCann technique that he was using at the time of mixing sand and sawdust into the hardboard, into the paint. It's a way of literally getting the landscape into the painting. The bottom two thirds are universal in their blackness and their darkness, just only interrupted by the swathe, this beautifully lucid swathe of white paint coming down through there in a lovely arc. My great view of McCann has always been, or for me personally I've always found, the quicker they're painted, almost the better they are. That just short, sharp, little burst of genius, of lucidity, of creativity, when it happens quickly. We see it as well in the God of His All Dark work. We know that these works didn't take a long time to, to create, yet somehow they're all the better for it. One of the features of Bill Hammond's painting frequently is a sense of isolation. When we look at many of the Buller's Birds works, we see the dramatic personae, the anthropomorphic figures, the birdmen, individualised and sitting waiting for the arrival uh, with a sense of unknown dread. In this work here, Jealous Lover, we have a crowd scene, and I think the interpretation of this work is about interaction and communication. What we read here is a variety of species. We have the, the bird heads and the horse heads and the individual sort of ghost-like human figures. But together this work, to me, is almost like a cinema crowd. There's a wonderful cinematic quality to many of Bill Hammond's large-scale paintings. And Jealous Lover, is a lovely, simple, resolved example of Hammond's psychological dramas, in this case, playing out in a large crowd, a community of kindred souls. Another special work in the sale, I think, is this McCann painting called Two Ongres, which uh, was done in 1954. It is, of course, part of McCann's Cowrie series, but the subject of it is the nude, the female nude. There's another work on the database, I think, which is explicitly referred to as cowrie nude. It's particularly successful, I feel. Painted in ink wash and gouache is directly a homage to Tuonga through the title. But to me, it feels like the artist is looking very closely at Cezanne. Cezanne once famously remarked, treat nature by the circle, the cone and the spear. And we see that that is exactly what McCann has done here. The breast of the lady through to the spiral and through down to the torso. And uh, I think what's a special note for this, we've got some paintings with some wonderful history in this sale. Billy Apple, the Don Driver, and also this work here. It's come from the collection of, of Don Wood, who's a good friend of Art and Object. And Don has had the painting since 1955. He was McCann's dealer at the time, and it was gifted by McCann to Don on the occasion of his wedding, and Don's had, had it ever since. So uh, fantastic provenance and a very beautiful, beautiful work. Billy Apple uh, was one of New Zealand's trailblazing artists in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, and his works in the 60s related to the pop art movement were exhibited as part of some really significant exhibitions in Britain and the United States in the 60s and 70s. His work frequently peels back the idea of the autograph artwork. So that in Apple's conceptual work, we're not looking at a revelation of the artist's soul or the artist's view of the world. In this particular work, we're looking at simply the mechanics of setting value within the art system. And Art and Object uh, is very much part of that system. And this is a work which goes to the absolute heart of the assigning of value. And here we are, 30 odd years after the creation of this work, sold that wonderful phrase, which of course uh, we live and die by here. We have to be honest about that here at Art and Object. But it is a dramatic a visual presentation, a billboard, an invoice, a statement, 
there which talks to the nature of the art object, the transaction, the setting of value, but of course sitting within the continuum of the art discourse. Uh, this work comes to the marketplace after 33 years and who knows what will happen to uh, the work in the future. And at this moment in time we get to revisit uh, the conceptual heft of Apple's work uh, over a career of some 50 years. This striking work by Seraphim Pick entitled Hideout has really prompted a lot of discussion uh, in the early few days of our viewing. And the conversations I've had with a number of visitors has been around the idea of the subconscious versus the unconscious. And that's a really interesting conversation because with many works which depict notions of reality, we always reach for a narrative. We seek to cling to, I think, to a certain extent, the idea of uh, a novel form in a painting. But I, like many viewers, quickly abandon uh, the requirement for a cohesive narrative and begin to make ourselves available. The viewer starts to make themselves available. It takes a little time, I think, to the disparate connections and weavings of meaning which are deeply personal in a work like this. There's something quite incongruous about this magnificent green blaze upon which this tableau takes place. And we can see connections with other New Zealand artists such as Bill Hammond in the construction of an invented reality which really asks the viewer to either seek their own meaning or to respond to the work in its own terms. And that's the challenge of a work such as Hideout.